Hello everyone, welcome to our session on Youth Lenses on Meaningful Access and Universal Connectivity. My name is Nicolas Fiumarelli from the Youth Coalition on Internet Governance. We will have a very interesting conversation today with some expert speakers here. I will go to present the, the speakers. We have Bia Barbosa from Nick Berri. Uh, she will be our main speaker on the Meaningful Access. So we have Nigel Hickson here. Uh, stakeholder is government. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, will be our main speaker for the multilingualism and universal acceptance part. So we have uh, our online uh, speaker, Adash Wu, that is from India. Uh, he will give us some advices on the rural connectivity. And finally, we have Nicolas Echanis <coughs> from the Alter Mundi um, that he will go into talk about a little about alternative models and community networks and some challenges about it. So, uh, and we will have Joshua Ashashi there uh, from the Youth Alliance. Uh, he will be our main um, online moderator. So, just starting with the session. <coughs> uh, well, th this session was a youth-led session that we try to to bring these expert speakers to talk about two or four uh, different topics, as I said, um, that are meaningful access and universal uh, connectivity. Um, there are several uh, key factors that we have seen from different policy networks on meaningful access, and uh, we, we know that it's not only about access, right? Um, well, this is a, a, a concept that is evolving in time, and what this evolution means to, to the policy. So how to define universal and meaningful access. There are several key aspects or that constitute them. Uh, for example, <clears throat> when we talk about universal acceptance, there could be about email address internationalized and internationalized domain names. That could be also about quality of services, uh, digital skills in the society. So we know that there are uh, several key elements. Um, I will start then with, with Bia Barbosa, asking, uh, in your opinion, Bia, uh, how can it be measured, uh, meaningful access, and what are the, the policy issues or, or the key elements with regard to achieving uh, a meaningful access? And I will share some slides I have uh, so you can. Thank you, Nicholas. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, who is watching us online. Good morning. So first, I would like to, to thank you for the invitation. I explain that I'm here replacing Raquel Gato. Uh, she's a lawyer and a member of the technical team of Niki.br, the, the Information and Coordination Center of .br in Brazil, which since 2005 has been responsible for the administrative and operational functions related to the .br domain in Brazil. Raquel was pregnant when this workshop was proposed, and then in November, Luca was born, <laughs> so unfortunately she couldn't be here with us, but she and Luca are well in Brazil, and I was given the task of replacing her. From another place of contribution to this debate, which is the Brazilian Internet Steering Committee, which I'm one of the 21 members representing the civil society. The, the Brazil Internet Steering Committee, the CGI, uh, establishes guidelines for the operation of the NIC, which is currently made, of, made up of six research centers and, uh, and houses the W3C chapter Sao Paulo. For us, the debate of the universalization of Internet access is a priority, being one of the main principles for Internet governance and news in Brazil. Uh, which govern the work of the Internet Steering Committee. For CGI, Internet access must be universal so that it can be a means of social and human development contribution to the construction of an inclusive, non-discriminatory society for, and for the benefit of all. However, as you mentioned, uh, and in the description of this workshop itself states, the concept of universal access has evolved over time and evidence increasingly indicates that access to connectivity is not sufficient on its own. While access to infrastructure is critical, without this access being inclusive, useful, sustainable and affordable, and linked to human capacity development and relevant content that can make it so, it would not achieve its positive potential. People and institutions from all sector and stakeholder groups should reflect on connectivity in a holistic way that takes into account how people are able to make use 
of connectivity once they do have access. In other words, for access to the internet to make a meaningful contribution to improving people's life, for strengthening national economies, it has to be approached in another way. But what we are talking about when we use the concept of meaningful access or meaningful connectivity. So I would like to ask you to share uh, a screen. Yeah. And here I will bring in the concept used by the Alliance for the Affordable Internet, who is, the, who is doing amazing work uh, to make this concept flourish in the world. Uh, for the Alliance, these are the four pillars of meaningful connectivity. Uh, the first one, a 4G-like speed. Understand that a 4G mobile connection as the minimum uh, threshold that can give us the speeds we need for the experience we want. Um, A4AI's analysis shows that we need an investment today of $428 billion uh, globally to achieve universal access to 4G equivalent quality by 2030, which means uh, downloads at a minimum of 10 uh, Mbps, around 75% around, uh, of the total investment cost to, to close the connective gap by uh, 2030 corresponds to the investment needed in 25 top countries. Uh, and I would mention just some of them like India, China, Brazil as well, <laughs> Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nigeria, Mexico, Ethiopia, where we are, Tanzania, Egypt, Democratic Republic of Congo, and other ones. Another, another pillar of um, meaningful connectivity would be an appropriate device. A4AI remembers us that to experience the full power of the internet, we need the right device for the task at hand. So a smartphone would give us the functionality to create and consume content in a way that basic phones don't. And the portability to use internet anywhere so ideally, we will have uh, access to a range of device types, but, we only, uh, but if we have only mobile, it has to be a smartphone. A third pillar of the, 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 the concept of meaningful connectivity is unlimited broadband connection. Uh, today, data caps prevent people from doing uh, certain online tasks or force them to wait until they can connect to public Wi-Fi, for example. An unlimited broadband connection at home or place of work or stud thus gives us reliable internet access in our daily lives to use the full breadth uh, of the internet potential. However, at the current rate of growth, According to the National Broadband Commission, 75% of the global population should have access to, broad to broadband only by uh, 2025. Several reports from international organizations have focused on the global to achieve the universal access by 2030. But in Brazil, for example, 90% of the uh, of the the, part, the the most poor part of our society have ac only access to the internet through their cell phones, which are very limited data packets that uh, last, uh, according to one of recent research at a survey that the, was organized by a civil society um, organization, lasts only 21 days a month. And finally, uh, it has to do with, with the data that I just gave you. Uh, a fourth pillar from uh, meaningful connectivity would be the daily use. So connecting occasionally is not enough. Daily access to the internet is the minimum we need to need. Uh, we need to see the real benefits for work, education, and communication. Um, the ITU, however, consider uh, an internet user someone uh, who has connected at least once in the last three months under any conditions. So if you consider this indication, for example, it's, it's, it's incredible, right? If we consider this indication, we will have in Brazil, we would have in Brazil, more than 80% of the internet users, of the, more than 80% of the population would, could be considered users of uh, internet. But it, this is really not the reality of the country, right? Um, so uh, I think that one of the first challenges that we have uh, related to public policies change these indicators uh, when what we call someone, uh, when we consider someone an internet user. But meaningful connectivity, it's only uh, one 
facet of what we can call meaningful access. And I'm sorry for the, the, the slide to be in Portuguese, uh, but uh, in addition to connection conditions, we need to consider affordability in a, sociality favor uh, a socially favorable environment for internet development in news. Affordability needs to consider, for example, the minimum wage of people in each country. In Brazil, for example, the people we can consider to have a significant access, a meaningful access, earn at least three times more than the minimum, uh, the minimum wage. Uh, and the other aspect of the uh, meaningful access on a society is the, the, is the socially favorable environment. But in my country, for example, more than uh, 120,000 students go to schools that don't even have access to electricity, to power. So another aspect that needs to be uh, considered in internet in use is also the inequities of gender, of race, of class, and in many countries, race and et ethnicity that impact how citizens uh, take advantage of the internet full potential. So to advance in digital equality, we need to understand not only inequalities in internet access, but get a full understanding of how women, for example, experience online, uh, experiences online diverge from men. And a woman-centric policies approach not only requires adequate gender-based data to inform policy, but also the participation and expertise of gender specialists in policies process. Anyway, for the most part of us here, the subject is not n new. We have been discussing it for decades, including the IGF, and today we already know what works and what's, uh, what is needed to connect more people and for everyone to enjoy the benefits of the internet. So the problem is to make it happen. What is, uh, what is stopping us to move from policy recomm recommendation to policy implementation? Two minutes more? Yeah, thank you. You can stop sharing the, the screen. It's fine. Uh, so I just would like to um, invite you um, to uh, know the, the, the policy network on meaningful access that has been launched last year. It was created in 2021 in the IGF process. Uh, it's a policy network that aims to provide in that look and why achieving meaningful and universal internet access remains so challenging in, in spite of years of efforts, efforts by policymakers and other actors from all stakeholder groups. I think that um, uh, we need a multi-stakeholder uh, environment and spaces to, to really understand why uh, all the knowledge that we have and the, uh, and the path that we need to follow to arrive in, in public policies that really guarantee this meaningful access or at least meaningful tech uh, connectivity um, uh, to, to be implemented. I mean, the multi-stakeholder spaces are very important to guarantee this kind of uh, implementation. In Brazil, for example, in the CGI, we have uh, a, a multi stakeholder chamber that's called Chamber of Universalization and Digital Inclusion that is formed by 16 members, fr four from each of the sectors representing the CGI, the, so the public authorities, companies, academia, and civil society. And one of the debates on the agenda is how to move forward to change access indicator used globally by the ITU and why we are also considering in Brazilian public policies. So uh, we need to change these indicators to show the concrete reality of internet access and use by Brazilians, and we invite you to do the same <laughs> in, other, in other countries. Just to finish, I would like to share with you, because it has to do with the other topics that we're going to debate here today, the chamber um, we also move forward from 2023 in on the debate about community networks based on a research that the CGI has just launched. It's called Community Internet Networks in Brazil, Implementation Experience and Challenges for Digital Inclusion. Inclusion. The research highlights um, that it's possible to foster policies that uh, support implementation models capable of listening to the population served, able to build a connectivity project together with the community. This is the core of community networks networks which aim to bring internet access to places with little inf infrastructure and services to regions where exclusively commercial models are not sustainable. So uh, we invite you to uh, know the, our research as well and to work in your own countries to build multi-stakeholder spaces to make these policies a reality. Thank you very much, Nicholas. 
Thank you so much, Fia. And you mentioned several things that are super important, like the speed of the internet, also about the gender, right? Um, the daily use. So we have seen several things, the cost of the connection, and, and some examples uh, under this research about uh, the possibilities for community networks. So now we are going uh, for a different topic, but it's all interrelated. Uh, so we have Nigel here to talk about multilingualism and some other key aspects that, that came out with the meaningful access and universal connectivity uh, that is more with the languages that we speak, right? Uh, so yes, I am passing the floor to Nigel right now. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I, so, yeah, I'm just a government official, so don't believe anything I say. But, uh, no, I work for the UK government uh, uh, in the Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, and thank you so much for inviting me to say uh, a, a few words this afternoon. I, I, I suppose, uh, having been in the government for 40 years or, or whatever, or in and out for 40 years, you know, you pick up a bit of the... Uh, pick a big bit up of the issues and uh, internet connectivity has been if you like a mainstay a gender item of the government's priorities for well ever since the internet started to become available i'll start by you know just telling you a story how important or no sorry how you know the situation we've reached today is incredible when you consider where we started. When we started adopting the internet in the, in the UK in the early 90s and the late 80s, no one had really <coughs> heard of what the internet could do. Government officials, ministers were not really interested. I remember one minister when I tried to get him to go to a, a, a conference this was at the time when the, some of the internet companies were just about starting. Uh, and uh, he could have met some important people at the time. And he said, well, you know, surely the internet is a bit like skateboarding. And I said, like skateboarding? Uh, I don't think the internet is like skateboarding. He said, yes, dear boy, dear boy. It's like skateboarding. It will go out of fashion soon. Uh, well, that's interesting because skateboarding probably hasn't gone out of fashion either, but uh, certainly the internet hasn't either. And I suppose in those early years, we were filled with optimism. In the early 90s, you know, the internet could do no wrong. I mean, true, not that many people were connected to it and we were rolling out programs for schools, we were putting computers into village halls, we were going around the country telling local authorities to uh, put some of their services online and to provide connectivity and, you know, it was an exciting time. And I suppose then we thought, well, you know, inevitably technology will uh, allow all the world to come online. Now, I mean, we weren't that naive in that, obviously, you know, in developing countries, you know, without electricity, et cetera, et cetera, you know, there were obviously challenges then as there's challenges now. But I think we thought in 20 years time or 30 years time, we would have solved these problems. You know, we would have had uh, more of the world's population online, but we still have challenges as, as has been outlined. And, you know, in terms of the meaningful connectivity that, uh, uh, that you rightly exposed or rightly spoke about. There are incredible challenges. And I suppose to us in, 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 in government, and I, I was talking at a session this morning, and I reflected on some of the messages from the UK IGF, from our, our own you know, UK IGF. And it's very funny because we were talking about the digital divide. And I mean, you might think, well, you know, those people in UK and Europe, why are they talking about the digital divide? It's okay for them. They haven't got a digital divide. But we have. I mean, it's true that in terms of connectivity, you know, most people, not everyone, if you live on top of a mountain in Scotland or something, you know, there are some areas still that haven't got connectivity. But by and large, if you want connectivity, you can have it in the UK, whether it's mobile or uh, broadband or, or, or whatever. But 6% of the population, 6% of the population in the UK see no reason to connect to the internet. Now, you know, that is a big number. Now, some of those 
you know, uh, like me, getting on a bit and perhaps didn't grow up in the uh, internet generation. I don't think my 96-year-old father uh, really understands the, <laughs> the internet. But that's still a large percentage of people that are not online in the UK. And as I say, they're not, it's not that they're not online because they can't be connected. It's because they don't either, they don't see a reason to be online, they're concerned about their data, or they just, you know, are not really attracted to what the internet can, can offer. Or perhaps, you know, in terms of expense and things like that. Although, you know, I must admit that's probably not such a factor in the UK affordability. But we have to address these these problems. And I think the concept of meaningful connectivity is 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 so important because it's no it's no point preaching to people about embracing the information society, embracing the internet, if we give them connections which are not sufficient. And, you know, I, I'm not arguing with your figures, you know, 4G or, you know, I, 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 I'm not an expert to argue what speed is meaningful or not. But, but clearly, you know, if we're concerned about meaningful connectivity, as I know that so many governments here in Africa and elsewhere and the ITU and their broadband commission and the internet society that does such incredible work. If we're really interested in meaningful connectivity, then we have to ensure that we have the skills, we have the affordability and the other the other attributes that are that are mentioned. I was going to mention just a couple of statistics from the from the ITU that just came out a week or so ago and uh, again perhaps you know these are just statistics from the ITU that 2.7 million people roughly one third of the global population remains unconnected so 2.7 billion people is just unacceptable isn't it only 60 percent of women are using the internet in 2022 compared to 69 percent of men again you know gender disparity three quarters of the global population aged 10 and over now own a mobile phone so we are getting there in terms of mobile penetration but there's so much to do and the youth aged 15 to 24 years are the driving force of connectivity, with 70% of young people worldwide now able to use the internet. 75% 70 of 15 to 24 year olds. So, you know, there is, there's a mixture of, if you like, hope, uh, but challenges still in, the, in, the, in, this, in this domain. But let me just go on and say a couple of things about multilingualism, because that's perhaps something I understand a bit more in terms of the technical side of things. So I, for my sins, worked for ICANN for a number of years. Uh, I left the government and I came back to the government. I'm not sure why, but anyway, so I worked for ICANN for a number of years. And what really excited me about domain names, and I didn't think actually anything would excite me about domain names, really. But what really excited me about domain names was international domain names. It was the ability of people to communicate, to innovate, to do whatever they wanted online in their own languages and in their own scripts. And this, I think, is, is fundamental to the, to the internet of the future. I mean, it's no point as going back and saying, you know, when the internet was created, why didn't it, <laughs> why wasn't it multilingual from day one? You know, we're not going to solve that debate. But we now have the opportunity through international domain names, uh, which can be, you know, both in relation to country codes and generic codes, so .com or, you know, uh, .eu or .uk or .fr, we can now ensure that we have international domain names. And that is something which I think is, 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 is really, really positive. And ICANN uh, and the community that feed I can, if you like, ought to be congratulated for the work that's gone on. There's many, many people here in Africa, in India, in China, in, in Russia and elsewhere that have dedicated so much time to be able to have international domain names in non-scripts, non, uh, non, uh, non sort of, uh, uh, non-European scripts. So I think that's, that's a really positive point. But the... And, and that will continue. And ICANN is uh, going forward in terms of a new application round, possibly in 20, 2024, which will allow other international domain names to, to, to come forward. 
that's the positive side. The negative side, or if you like, uh, uh, one of the challenges, is something we call universal acceptance. And that's the problem that you might well have a, a domain name in a, in a different script, but is that domain name accessible? It, can you use that domain name to connect to the wider internet? Is, can you go on to social media? Can you go on to your public services? Can you order taxes? Can you order food? Can you do the things that you would expect to do in London or New York or Frankfurt or Geneva or you know wherever? Can you do it in your own script? And that is the challenge. And to many of us, I think we, we feel it's unacceptable that you can't do that because the technical solutions are there. There are no technical barriers to enabling all the servers and all the, uh, all the different uh, web servers and the resolvers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that make up the architecture of the internet. There's no reason why they can't be adapted, upgraded to ensure that they accept scripts. But of course, there are challenges in, in, in everything we do. And the final point of this is it's not just different scripts, it's also longer domain names. So we, when, we, uh, when we had an application round in ICANN in 2012 and over 1,760 applicants for new names, resulting in about 1,580 or whatever it was now of new gene or generic top-level domains, it used to be 22 before 2012, now it's you know 1,500, so you can have dot bank, you can have dot XYZ, you can have dot sucks, you can have dot porn, I'm not saying you want all these things, but you, you, you know, and you can have dot Berlin, and you can have dot London, you can have dot Wales, and you can have dot Paris, and you know, there's lots and lots of domain names. But what, what happened, what was found, is that if you made your domain name too long, you know, six or seven characters. So if you, if instead of just having Paris, you had North Paris or, you know, <laughs> whatever, and some bus companies had their own name, Stagecoach, for instance, you know, they found also that those, those names were not, if you like, compatible with the, the technology of the, of the internet. So there's challenges ahead of us, but uh, because of the excellent work that people put in, I, I'm, I'm sure we're going to solve many of these issues. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And uh, I want to say for those of you online, if you have any questions, comments, just drop them in the chat as well. Um, getting to the last uh, minutes of the uh, uh, meeting, we will open the floor for audience to ask their questions and also for uh, a survey basically on Mentimeter.com. So just get ready and then open Mentimeter and then we'll be announcing the code where you can input your answers to that question. Thank you, Joshua. <clears throat> yes, at uh, the last 10 minutes, we will have a poll in the screen when you will access by your mobile phone, the, the online and the on-site will access. And it's a beautiful experiment for uh, finish talking with, with some of the key points. Uh, thank you, Nigel, for your insights. Uh, you know, uh, IDN and local content also in their own languages are issues that are very important for, for connecting the, the, the resting people to the internet because People need to learn English to, to access the internet sometimes, so, and they need to, to, to write in Occidental characters or Latin characters, you know, and they could have their own keyboards uh, with different uh, uh, chart sets, so it's a difficulty for them. Uh, it's, a, it's a reality, and maybe that is one of the main challenges for having a, the next billion connected to the internet, right? Uh, that could be something to work on. But there are other challenges, so we are now facing two others uh, from India, our experts in, the, in rural connectivity. Adars has been a, a, a chair of the ISOC Rural Development Special Interest Group. Uh, you know that the Internet Society is changing every year the special interest group based on the community feedback. And this, the, the rural development is not, is, is one that the special interest group that didn't exist anymore, but uh, Adars has uh, participated uh, several years in developing different things for the rural community. So, uh, Adars, uh, you have like 10 minutes to comment on uh, what are the, the best the challenges for the, the specific rural communities, uh, how to work with them, and uh, also about education or, or connectivity. Uh, so, the floor is yours, Adars. Sure. Thank you. Uh, 
Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Adash here from India. Thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, for um, introducing me. So it was a great pleasure to share my experience, what all that we have faced with respect to the rural sector. So it is a lot of difference based upon the statistics that I've shared uh, from our um, colleagues. So it is with respect to the ITU statistics, most of the like and uh, what the billion numbers that we will see. Uh, so unconnected ones are the digital divides, most of them from the rural areas. So it is like and completely and remote access with and zero access. So it is like a lot of challenges will be there. So the completely the differs uh, with respect to the urban and the rural sectors. So as we are like and seeing it, one is the major challenge with respect to the uh, I would like to go through what are all the different kind of challenges, the major challenges are there, and what could be the advantages can bring in, and what are the with respect to the uh, sustainable like and uh, policies we can bring in. Uh, so that makes each and everyone as like the rights to access the internet as like an, in a, a meaningful way. So internet access like an affordability uh, affordability is the major one concern. So it is like in cost of service and the devices. So when we discuss it much more in the rural sectors, rural areas, the lack of access points and the quality and even the speed of the network is also uh, plays major role. So a lot of internet services are there. The speed will also comes into picture even uh, due to the like and due to in cities like in rural areas due to the natural calamities and the weather conditions. The speed there could be a chances possibilities of the internet. The uh, speed goes down. So this is a lot of challenges even uh, they have faced. Uh, and even the second thing is like with respect to the digital skills. So once they have an access, certain limitations may come in and such as like a digital skill, language barrier, and even the information overload, and even as well as like an impacting the way them for them to extend those with access to the use of the internet. So third thing is like missing local content. So everyone, the rural areas, when we mention about so not, not everyone know about the language, like is with respect to especially the English. So much more, everyone is familiar with their, their local languages. If you choose a country like in India, there will be a multiple local languages will be there. So each and every uh, areas with respect to the rural areas. So the local languages, they, they're not aware about an English and they're not aware about an even much more other languages. They face like in completely as an internet to access it. So completely as like can uh, the barrier for them. So they, they can't uh, access that you know, other than the local language. So that also one of the major barrier for them, like in missing the local content. So uh, that is much more, which is important. So. The fourth thing uh, which comes up in my mind is like with respect to the restricted access and use. So this is very much uh, interesting, lot of differ from the urban and the rural sector. So young people, especially the youth, so the community and the family context, when we look into it, determines, for example, if the uh, rural woman, so uh, wants to participate in the access of the internet and wants to buy the smartphone, they feel like an, uh, the family members or they are not like an agree because they don't want, they won't feel that safe. So. Uh, it is like an extent of an optimal use of their ability to address the challenge uh, and many especially teens and young women are uh, described that uh, with respect to the accessing these devices they are not an untrustable one so they can't access the internet without the device and all so this is like an restricted access that is the one more major concern with respect to the rural aspects and the safety and the privacy concern so safety and privacy uh, when we look into it limited internet use so participants are like an aware of the uh, dangers for, which was found in online and the rumors that is like a fake news and even such as like a scamming either through the duplication of the personal data. So these are the things when they hear into uh, it. So the rural is the first one just to get scared. So with respect to the safety concerns and the, with respect to the privacy concerns. So that's one more point. So which is like keeping them uh, so which is far away from the access of the internet. So. In addition to all this, so, so there are a lot of things bringing the internet uh, to each and every rural area. There are a lot of benefits could be bringing. So that could one among it could be like an uh, the business. So restricting the business that are like an restricted to a rural area can eventually expand to uh, the business into the uh, in in the market outside the uh, limitation. So that with that helps with respect to the digitalization. So and even um, helping the speed internet brings easy for them to health and as as well as for the education as well. So uh, the internet became as like similar to like a textbook. So without an other textbooks do, uh, without the textbooks in a school of the education won't run in the same way internet has to be. It's like a rights for every everyone to access it and to learn it and to make use of it. So uh, this is what with an high speed internet access is required. And libraries in rurals are like lately supported uh, by broadband internet and frequently undergoes like an early assignments and, and with respect to the public interest and the involvement. So and also 
uh, there are like a lot of recommendations we can keep up uh, with respect to the which, which well keeping in the rural in mind so one is like an infrastructure so infrastructure always have a room for the improvement so we need to focus on the expanding the speed and of the internet and extending the network throughout the areas that are like still uh, undeserved so and also the public awareness is very very important with respect to the uh, rural so because the local public, uh, people won't uh, have an idea how to verify the fake news, how to uh, like and trust the things. So the awareness is much more important regarding the significance of the internet usage and how to make use of the maximum out of the high speed internet and the communities, especially the particularly. So prices and the package also keep, uh, we have to keep in mind being offered to a rural area, especially that to be affordable to some people who think they can go without it, uh, uh, like and without it and at least get familiar with the uh, eventually taking the benefits uh, around it. So, uh, if we look into the some of the uh, like and recommendations with respect to the policymakers, if we want to, we need to uh, to engage the ru rural communities much more. So we need to understand. So in the discussions, how many the rural communities are present? So this is with respect to the governance, with respect to the technology, with respect to the even like a multi-stakeholderism. When we consider, so we need to keep in mind that even the rural also plays a major role. So we need to engage the rural communities in the broadband policy agenda as a part of an agenda. And also, we have to embed the meaningful connectivity as a part. And also, we have to leverage the public access solutions. So, uh, which which is very much important. Uh, we need to consider. Um, I hope uh, this is this is like I would like to uh, share. Um, yeah, over to you, Nicholas. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Now we are going to to Nicolas Echanis from Alter Mundi. Uh, he told me that he was in a in a an urgency, but hoping that you can join. Ah, you are there. Excellent. So Nicolas Echanis is a part of Alter Mundi, a non-profit organization uh, in measuring the the different community networks and with some key points on how to advance on, on these alternative solutions for for uh, marketing for connectivity models so nicolas i see you there <laughs> um, beautiful day also in argentina and um, well please uh, told us a little tell us a little about the, the community networks and, and your challenges the floor is yours There are some things that I need, I think we we need to address. Um, one of them that I think is important is uh, that when, when we mention um, meaningful connectivity can be considered uh, when we have 4G connection as a minimum, I think this is tricky and I actually think it's dangerous to use this as a, as a measure. Um, because 4G connect, I, I, I mean, we should say 10, 10 megabit per second uh, download and maybe also 10 megabit upload. We never talk about upload speeds and that's one of the biggest problems with uh, mobile connectivity for, for G or, or any other alternative. Uh, but it's not just that. Uh, we all know that, for example, in Latin America, um, mobile connectivity is always limited in very strange and artificial manners. Like, for example, if you buy, um, I don't know, five uh, giga, gigabytes of traffic, uh, they expire. No, like uh, as if, for example, you were to buy uh, food 
and uh, you get the food to your home and then if you don't eat your food then the supermarket comes and takes the food from your refrigerator because it's not valid for you to consume anymore uh, and that's what happens with mobile connectivity in for mostly in in latin america and uh, it's also limited to outside connectivity people in their in their homes in rural areas usually have uh, little to no connectivity so it really doesn't make sense to speak about uh, meaningful connectivity and uh, talk about uh, 4g as a measure that uh, considering that um, there is also the problem of if we won't uh, consider mobile as the as the base then what we must consider is regular broadband connectivity and in rural areas it's really very difficult to get uh, mobile um, broadband connectivity to the houses and uh, this is already expressed by the gsma report uh, stating that uh, if they cannot secure uh, at least 5,000 clients, they cannot deploy their networks because it's not um, affordable, it's not feasible. And so that leaves us with, I think, mostly uh, two or three options. One of them is uh, small providers. Uh, it's uh, very usually a family business, family run business. And these are usually services that are uh, lacking in quality and expensive in price. And this brings the need for the state to help out. And in some countries, for example, in Argentina, we have a big network, a big backbone network provided by the by the country by the state, the RSAT network. And this network has more than 30,000 kilometers of fiber all over the country, but the state cannot provide connectivity to the houses. They usually bring connectivity uh, to the border of our villages. And then it requires providers to get to the uh, fiber node with fiber. Uh, so this creates a new problem where providers uh, in small areas are usually working with wireless technology and they are asked by the government carrier to deploy uh, 100, 200 or one kilometer of a uh, fiber network. And uh, this is usually impossible for them uh, or very difficult. And uh, so what we think is that we need to work together um, community networks with the state and with small providers community networks um, have the opportunity to work together for a better service at a lower price and they can usually um, find the means to get to interconnect to those uh, fiber backbones. Uh, for example, here in, in our own town in, in Quintana, we have a neighboring village that, that is called uh, Los Molinos, where we have a fiber node. And this fiber node has been here uh, installed by the government for over a year and uh, no provider had connected to the node. And not, not only had no provider connected to it, but the node itself is placed on a public school and the public school has no internet connection. The internet connection for the school is brought by the community network, not by the state network, which is located there. Uh, so what we're working on right now is to create a small uh, IXP, a small internet exchange point that will be administered by, by the community networks in our area, but it will be accessible also for small providers, for cooperative providers, 
and for small village state-owned providers uh, so they can uh, get to a central tower here in the IXP and then interconnect to the state fiber easily. And what we think is that this should be uh, adopted in all the region. Uh, and in Argentina in particular, in, in Cordoba where we are, we have a not only a national state-owned network, but also a, a state-owned network of the province. And uh, we are working on um, developing such IXPs that can interconnect to this network for the benefit of all the small providers. And the benefit of all the small providers uh, is what actually uh, will benefit the people in these regions. Uh, the other thing that I think is very, very important is to, to get um, enough funds for the community networks. And, and also here in Argentina, we were able to create a program called the Roberto Arias program, which as far as I know, is the first program from a government that is uh, dedicated to funding only community networks with uh, money from the Universal Service Fund. And this is, I think, another initiative that would be very interesting to be uh, adopted in, in other regions. Uh, I'm sorry for my uh, complicated participation. Uh, this helped it uh, to the panel, and I am open to questions later. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Nico. Really helpful. And you also mentioned very interesting key points like or challenges, for example, the role of the IXPs in connecting with the networks themselves. Um, for example, the, to have these small internet service providers that could be also cooperative. So you mentioned these alternative things that could be very, very helpful to connect the ones that are very isolated and in a small groups, right? Uh, it's not the same if you have a, a, a a big population of people in the rural area as having a, a small population, like maybe 30 houses there that are isolated in, in some place. So you really, the government or the internet service providers are not getting in there. So you you, you will need to find uh, and very, very good uh, thing you mentioned about having this node there, but no <laughs> service provider connecting to the node. So at the end is, is a, a problematic of profitability for the internet service providers or, or for the governments. Uh, and we need to find, or the communities need to find alternative models to, to connect. So creating these cooperatives or kind of things. So now we uh, following, uh, I will, <coughs> yes, uh, for all the online and the on-site attendance, if you have your mobile phone at, at hand, you can go to menti.com and enter the following code I will share with you. That is 58432996. And my online moderator also, Joshua, is putting in the chat. Um, I will share the screen. And then when I will give the floor to Joshua to mention some of the questions we have in the chat and open the floor also to the audience and our speakers to respond to the questions while we are seeing the Mentimeter in the screen. So Joshua, the floor. Yes, um, we have two questions in the chat from uh, the same person, Sergei Romanov. Uh, he says, first, um, many countries are faced with a lack of devices. Um, just give me a few seconds. Yeah, so many countries are faced with a lack of devices, weak infrastructure, low levels of digital literacy and digital skills. What steps should be taken to tackle these issues? And as a follow-up to that question, he's asking, what is the role of the youth in solving issues uh, in this regard? Yes, I think this is a question for others that is more related with the digital skills, and then I will answer the part of the youth. So others, go ahead. So thanks for this question. Uh, so what are the key elements that constitute uh, universal and meaningful internet access, and what are the challenges to face? Um, so the key elements is like, the first thing is like with having an um, uh, like and with respect to the thing, uh, the 
like an uh, the internet access with the speed access so the first, so the first thing is like an having an access without an access having a digital skill having an like an um, uh, the local content or as the training or as what whatever that will provide is of all no use so first thing we need uh, like and we must provide a, a, a internet access with an infrastructure so and second thing is like not only providing an infrastructure how to sustain it for the longer term so it has to keep, come, uh, go on so and the second as a sec with an addition to the second step we need to provide the digital skill for the local um, uh, especially keeping in the mind up in rural which is completely blind about the internet what the internet is and that is what we want to give the digital skill and we want to give the awareness uh, skill with respect to the how to make use of the things and all so and the question i have like an the uh, like an uh, gadgets so this is very very important so they have they have like a lot of rural areas and all we have seen so uh, so there is an internet uh, infrastructure internet available but they don't have the devices so mo most of the youth especially in the rural so consider me like an uh, around like a 60 70% of you don't use the mobile phones so they are completely out of the uh, like and uh, the electronic devices even the not uh, forget about the a computer or laptops even the basic gadgets like a mobile phone they don't have an, uh, at all so that is the major important thing how can we with because we have infrastructure we have an internet and without the gadget how can they access the internet so even especially even if we have a local content data so out out they can go with and accessing the internet these are the different two kind of any challenges they have that we need to look into it and access uh, we need to resolve uh, uh, the things yeah i hope i have answered yeah. I think that something important is to to say that the youth, for example, when they are learning and they are the most active users we have seen in the internet, so they are the most affected also, but they are the ones with the solution. Sometimes they can leader, have this leadership in mm -hmm, have this leadership like in the communities, uh, in try and they can talk with the with the main people in these rural areas, for example, and tell them, okay, we can form a cooperative, we can uh, find a better ways or, or a digital education uh, program or maybe a, an app in, uh, for the children. So there are many, many things that the, the, the youth have the skills to, to, to start doing and helping all the community. And I think that that is a good way uh, to, to, to go to, to forward into the next video, right? Uh, I don't know if the panelists have uh, some reflections on uh, on these topics, on if you disagree with yourself, so now is the time. So I just thank you. I just would like to uh, to uh, briefly comment on one of the topics that the other uh, speakers uh, mentioned. Uh, the things about the multilingualism, I think that is go inclusive beyond the internet, because if you look what is going on in this IGF, for example, uh, we are we have to speak English to be part of the discussion, to the debate, and this excludes already uh, uh, the 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 all uh, the most part of people that of course doesn't speak English, but the, it, it's excluded they they already excluded. Uh, a part of our society um, that doesn't have access to education, doesn't have access to uh, to learn a foreign language, and including for us from Latin America, it's not obvious to speak in English. And then, um, uh, if we, we consider the IJF a very important space for uh, debate and build another perspective from the the multi stakeholder uh, internet governance, and if we start excluding the people that don't speak English or don't, don't speak other uh, global languages, if I can put this way, which I don't like. Um, we, we are not solving the problem. We are dipping the inequality, right? So uh, what about Nico mentioned? Uh, nice to see you again, Nico. It's been a while. Um, we don't met each other. But I think it's super, I, I, I totally agree with him uh, how tricky is to use uh, the idea of 4G and mobile connection as a baseline for uh, meaningful connectivity. But um, so if we would put a higher standard on this, it, it would show how far we are further <laughs> from from the, the perspective of uh, a really meaningful access to the most part of the population, right? And what um, our colleague from India mentioned about engaging the rural, com uh, the rural community on this agenda, I just uh, would like to share that in Brazil, for example, we, have for we had for the first time 
uh, women representative from the rural workers uh, uh, as a member of the Committee on Consumer Rights in the National Telecommunications Agency in Brazil. So it's the first time that we have this opportunity to uh, uh, not only speak uh, for the rural area, but have a real representative from this community in the in the committee, and is is very it has been very interesting to to learn from them and to uh, better um, know. The, all the, the, chal the challenge that they face. And about the youth role in this process, I totally agree with you, Nicolas. And I think that the Youth uh, Internet Governance Forum process uh, gives us uh, each year many examples on how it's important to really uh, establish a place on the table for the youth, not only to um, uh, be treated as users or have users of the internet, but also as uh, part of the response that we need to, to give. Yes, thank you so much uh, for that answer. And please, if anyone is here and wants to give a comment or question, you are warmly welcome to do so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm Alexandre from Brazil. I also works with Mrs. Beatriz. Uh, <laughs> It's a youth, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I was wondering with the comment that Nigel made that, like, I think the British uh, British citizens, uh, almost six percent, are not uh, really intending to get connected to the internet. I'd like to hear from you if how can we perhaps uh, approach this this aspect to in, in, in a given framework of of meaningful access. Uh, for instance, we have submitted a proposal to this IGF that we'd like to bring community perspectives to shape the concept, and it wasn't approved. <laughs> so, uh, uh, despite they said that it was excellent uh, feedback and so on, but I mean, how can we really make sure that uh, I'm meaningfully connected if I really want to be connected, and for what, which purposes? Well, I mean, thank, thank you very much. It's great to see uh, Brazil in force. Uh, I won't mention the football. What was it? I, I'm not sure where the football. But, uh, I, I mean, I think you know we, there are many reasons that people, you know, perhaps do uh, do not connect, and I mean, clearly, connectivity at its at its core is 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 incredibly important. I mean, if you don't have any connectivity, then, you know, let's not worry about the affordability of the device, you know, if you can't connect at all. But what I also think we have to take into consideration is, is, is people's perception of the value of, of, of the internet. Now, when I talk to my daughter about this, she doesn't really understand what I'm talking about, because she said, well, without Without the internet, I couldn't live. You know, uh, she certainly couldn't adopt such a busy schedule, perhaps. But uh, social schedules. But you know, I I think one of the problems that we 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 face is 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 that we are seeing people that simply do not want to connect anymore because of what they perceive to be either the dominance of certain platforms and and you know that they they don't. They just don't like the way that, that platforms conduct their business, and you know I'm not commenting on that, but that in 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 some research we find this. Some people are are just petrified about their data being stolen. And I, I I think this applies not so much to perhaps young people who 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 are uh, savvy enough to find ways of of not doing this, but to uh, you know to people of the older generation they. They're told of the scams. They're told of uh, phishing. They read in their daily newspapers about all these sites that you shouldn't, uh, you know, if you're approached by your bank, you should tell them to go away. If you're approached by the tax office, it's not going to be the tax office. If you're approached by your retail supermarket, it's not the supermarket. And and you know this 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 means that people sort of you know shy away. Now during the pandemic, I mean, 
we saw a bit of the opposite effect that people were coming onto the internet because of you know they 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 wanted the services you know which they they couldn't go out outside for but uh, so I think we have to address all these well, I, I, I'm just waffling on but we need to address you know the fundamental points that have been pointed out today but we also need to ad address trust and that that is also fundamental Sorry. yes we are closing the session thank you so much for all your insight we don't have time for more questions but I want to mention that uh, from the youth coalition we are going to submit a contribution to the global digital compact also to the PNMI uh, working group and just to mention some of the key points of the global digital compact roadmap that are related with this session like achieving universal affordable connectivity by 2030 that is something that will be a good challenge for <laughs> the following years and also I can mention uh, the issue of building uh, a more effective architecture for digital cooperation and and this issue of uh, strengthening the digital capacity building that is related also with the digital skills needed to to be part of the internet or a digital citizen and also in the way of ensuring digital inclusion for all we talk about multilingualism including the most vulnerable or the the, the ones that don't know english actually so that are some key points that are interrelated from the global digital compact with uh, these topics we were talking today so thank you so much for the audience and a good applause Thank you.